how conscious are we of the temptation of relishing in hobnobbing with government and its agencies? Your first name basis as the State Chairman of the Nigerian Labour Congress. So your, your occupation becomes, oh, I must not do anything or say anything that would negatively impact on that relationship. To what extent are we keeping in view the other half of our responsibility? I think we have already acknowledged that we are also supposed to carry the concerns, the culture, the aspirations, the desires of the mass to government which on account of bureaucracy may not be prompt enough to deal with these issues. By the time you substitute yourself for the mass of the people, they're not hearing from them, they're not holding meetings with them. You assume you know what they want and what they say. You simply use their name to create assets for yourself to help not with government and the I feel your pockets in the process. Do you expect to be taken seriously? So when our president talked about National wide spread. It calls for concerted efforts. Now, there was uh, an assessment of our last outing, the one day National Day of Action against the security. Leader. Part of the critique of that outing was that it was more of a foisting as a program. It's like we foisted it on some of our affiliates and potential allies. We had decided that that was a good thing to do and the timing was right. It became a fire brigade kind of uh, escapade. We were calling affiliates a day before or two days before. Whereas that outing ought to have been preceded. Of course, we make room, we make allowance for uh, emergencies. There can be developments in the country that demand immediate response. But our ability to summon our affiliates and our members at the moment's notice and expect good enough response from them is a function of the extent to which this painstaking work and clarification of the issues and, and, and mutual strengthening of each other had been the case on an ongoing basis. We must meet with labor. The executive go out of the way, not because we are inviting labor to come and participate in demonstrations, we just want to meet and exchange views, areas of common concern. 
must meet with professional groups. I've seen the list of NGOs that are conferencing together in Congos. There are those whose sphere of work touch on the medical profession. We must organize meetings with the NMA, with the pharmacists, with the nurses, even while we are bringing out how their services relate to our own special area of interest as an NGO. So that, that bonding, that building of mutual confidence is on, on an ongoing basis. It is that that provides room for joint work and collaboration. Even in attending meetings and organizing uh, educational programs and protest matches. Immediately after that, National Day of Action, you all recall what happened. The very day after, Mr. Governor called a meeting in civil society. If we are not imbued with that illusion of importance in hobnobbing with government and its agencies, It did not make sense that we should hold a meeting before we go there. Yes, yes, sir. And articulate our position on issues we consider important for the moment. Okay. Understand Mr. Governor called for that. Mm -hmm. Of course, we were not in a position to immediately answer him. And I don't even think a meeting has been held since then to respond to that. Why will you not look down on civil society and make caustic remarks? So the um, Broadness of our vision and the spread of our affinities has a way of defining the tasks. At the level of the conference, the relationship between your leadership and that of the affiliates is also a dialectical one. Much as you derive strength from them is the responsibility of your leadership to also provide strength to them to analyze the situation we find ourselves and see which of the affiliates are committed to issues of the moment <coughs> such that your leadership can even Recommend programs. I would, uh, at this time, well, maybe this is the time to talk about it. Uh, I'm using this occasion to make a call or in Nigerian charter for popular participation in government. Nigerian charter for popular participation in governance. It's, uh, it's a concept that I'm very passionate about. It derives Nigerian charter 
a popular part. It derives from a critical assessment of the challenges confronting Nigeria right now. I don't think it's an overstatement to say that what we are witnessing in Nigeria right now is mediocrity rule. Of 1961 and 1962 that created uh, uh, cattle grazing. Anybody who had been to me. It's the uh, Attorney General of Federation. Where are the gazettes now? Don't <laughs> lose. Hands are not in position of authority at all. Or public power. The best ideas cannot be implemented. Some of the reasons for this are not too far fetched. There are imperfections. In the electoral politics of Nigeria, monetized politics mm -hmm. of inducement to buy cheap clothes and so on, bags of rice, nylon bags of uh, onions, palliative. Mm -hmm. God, for that reason, which breeds opportunism, the power mm. chair. No ideas, no ideas. Mm. Just to have food in the stomach for that. Day. The converse of that is the extent to which apathy. So this whole process, we are talking about that earlier. Politics is a dirty game. So those who we may ascribe competence to stay away from this process. Not me. But the result will be domination and pervasiveness of the incompetent. Ordinary water of man begins to drink. So the consequence of all of this is the process of governance, particularly the budget making process, which has become one for the creation of business opportunities for friends, family members, and fronts. Half-baked, ill-thought-out ideas, white elephant projects are conceived and adopted for implementation without scrutiny at astronomical prices and costs. And these have little or no impact on the standard of living of the vast majority of the Nigerian people. The slogan is, the bigger the project, the bigger the loot. So we are not surprised
contractors from wherever they come from come into your community. They put big signboards, they bring a few equipment, if they look like look man. <laughs> I don't want to call you zone. Before you know it, they come and start removing their equipment. They leave the signboard there. <laughs> What has happened? You don't know, you don't ask. NDDC. You turn the local college road from uh, New Lagos Road, you see maybe one kilometer that you can see from the express. Unfortunately for you, that is the way to my house. After one kilometer, what now happened? Pardon. This uh, because of the road that they are doing now. How many times have they done it? The same thing. The non justiciable provisions of Chapter 2 of the Constitution of 1999, amended in some of its sections, has uh, made provision for popular participation in government. Similarly, since uh, I think 1990, Nigeria has been a signatory to the African Charter on Popular Participation in Transformation and Development. These are, these, are, these are documents that you, as the Conference of NGOs, must be very familiar with. African Charter on Popular Participation in Transformation and Development. A step in the right direction would be to engage the National Assembly to enact a law to domesticate the enforcement of this charter in Nigeria to create avenues for popular input into the process of formulation implementation and review of all policies, programs and projects in the public realm in Nigeria. Mr. President has shown himself to be totally out of time. You cannot be a Democrat if you cannot yield to superior ideas. So, because I was elected as a president, you were elected as president, you can be removed. Yes, exactly. Are we bound to be saddled with this mess in 2020? Mm -hmm. This is the only way to deal with this mediocrity rule. And yes, mess of lives and hopes and aspirations. Looked at the African Charter, it needs to be worked on to domesticate and bring out the salient points which we are calling for to be enacted as a law in the Nigerian Charter for Popular Participation in Government. So, whether it is security, all policies, all programs, all projects. Right now, the Academy of Sciences, our professors, their talents are not being put to use. So if we have a law like this that makes it makes it compulsory for any policy, program, or project is adopted for implementation. Of course, we know that in the legislative process, they used to have public hearings. Although not a lot of our people take advantage of that opportunity. But we want to extend that now to the executive arm. 
That is the bail of development in our country. The executive arm consists of an idea, does it allow for any critical assessment, it starts to implement. That's how they turn each other into billionaires overnight. Over projects that apply from inception, they don't they don't they don't expect or even wish to implement. Is that to feel it? Now, if you take a look at the fiscal responsibility bill, which had been an attempt to address some of these issues, it doesn't fall, doesn't go quite far enough. Because in that fiscal responsibility act, section 48 only calls for publication and full disclosure. But that is after the fact. It doesn't quite address the initiation, conception, and consideration of those projects. It simply says, whatever you, are, you have spent, make it known. So we are saying that popular input should come at an earlier point in time in the, in the process. The UN Convention against corruption and the African Convention against corruption also makes room, or make room, both make room, for participation by civil society groups to what extent can we say EFCC and ICPC has actively gone out of their way to co-opt the participation of the CSOs in this all important fight against the corruption of the uh, So, for I'm women, okay. civil society, courage is an attribute to speak words of truth because we can see an alternative paradigm. That is, that things can be done differently and better and socially beneficial. Have you bought a level one? Yeah. I bought a level. When you are an activist, a genuine one, our culture protects you. Yes. Nobody must touch you. Okay. These same recyclers we talked about, they are removing uh, manhole covers. Exposing people to danger. People are falling in. Benicity. Today, trailers come from different parts of the country to bring goods. These trailers deliver their goods right in front of the stores that are the ultimate distribution point. Making Mission Road right now We have, talked, we have talked about there are no bus stops and, and you go to pay people those you know. <laughs> yeah, no, you see. Yeah. How can how can how can the trailer park in front of the stop? They are they are they are, they are discharging their goods in the heart of the city. What has happened to the idea of having a trailer park in the outskirts of town? A point for transshipment. Auto pilot, single pretty road, and anarchy in the road.
just a little bit and run up the history of NGOs. It's an independent voluntary association of people acting together for a common purpose other than achieving government office. You cannot do what you are doing. And the goal is not to occupy government house. The goal is not also to make money. So there's a certain level of altruism, deriving satisfaction from service in the community. Of course, you cannot engage in uh, illegal or criminal activities. No NGO say go and set a house on fire. You deal with ideas. And ideals. So, non governmental organizations, as the name implies, uh, can be traced to when governments emerged in the affairs of society. It's only when governments have come into existence that you can talk about non governmental organizations. So, it dates back. So before 1848, I'm going to close on that. But formally, as far back as 1910, as many as 132 international NGOs are recorded, not only to have been in existence, but we are already cooperating with each other. At the level of the formation of the United Nations, the League of Nations in 1919, after the First World War, channels of liaison with uh, these private organizations were created. But in 1945, at the establishment of the United Nations, uh, relations with NGOs uh, were strengthened, particularly as the status of uh, ECOSOC, the Economic and Social Council, uh, became uh, enhanced to that of the principal organ of, of the UN. By Article 70, Article 70 and 71 of the UN Charter, participatory roles in deliberations at the level of the UN, uh, but without a vote, uh, were recognized. Uh, and an arrangement for consultation of NGOs uh, was also uh, provided for. Uh, although it isn't until the 70s that the term NGO really in the currency. Fundamental features of the NGO, as I have mentioned, is, uh, include independence from direct control of any government. Uh, an NGO cannot be constituted as a political party. Uh, it is non-profit making, non-violent, and cannot engage in uh, criminal activities. I have touched on this by the presentation so far. Uh, the role of the NGO is to overcome shortcomings that uh, governments face by being able to act more quickly as compared to government bureaucracy. Uh, they are designed to win the trust of the community. to apprise government policy making about the lives, capabilities, attitudes, and cultural characteristics of the people. That's why we talked about speaking on behalf of the people with those in public office, and also taking information the other way, uh, facilitate and bridge communication gaps between the leadership and the followership and of course, networking with other organizations doing similar or related work is uh, it's an important aspect of your work. Uh, specifically, NGOs are charged to be spokespersons for the poor, the oppressed, the disadvantaged, uh, to influence government policies in their favor, but to conduct research and publicize the results. I know that many of you already know that uh, 
can enjoy a status with the United Nations that is uh, consultative, particularly with the Economic and Social Council. So if your NGO does good enough work, you can enjoy a status with the United Nations that is consultative. You can have a general status or a roster status who list you. You can also enjoy a special consultative status if you have distinguished yourself. So, and of course, NGOs may be accredited to participate in specialized conferences where you have demonstrated uh, competence. Uh, NGOs in Nigeria, well, civil liberties organizations, campaign for democracy, CDHR. CDD, Center for Democracy and Development, uh, People's Problems and Solutions, PPS, Catholic Bishops Conference. Uh, we cannot talk about the struggle against military rule, 1984 and 1998, without this civil society who haven't played the pivotal role. Uh, don't also forget that uh, around 2000 and uh, seven, there was a civil society coalition against third term. You remember that uh, Bassanjo wanted to prolong mm -hmm. his uh, stay in government. Mm -hmm. Civil society that said, uh, no way. Uh, 2012, Nigerians united against subsidy removal. Mm -hmm. This is part of our recent uh, history. There's also the CSOs for electoral reform that gave birth to the Justice Ways Letter Reform Committee. Many members of that committee were CSO members. Of course, bring back our girls, 2014. On the other side of the divide, we have uh, pro-government NGOs. Because as these NGOs gain in respectability and influence, Government also wanted to, to counter uh, them. Don't forget, youth MSB asked for a battle. Mm. Huh? Mm -hmm. There's the one they call Stand Up Nigeria, SUN. There's the Center for Social Justice, Equity, and Transparency. They also, they also pick words like we do. <laughs> you know, coalition of CSO against corrupt persons in Nigeria. All these NGOs. During the Buhari regime, came out to agitate for support for subsidy removal. In fact, some of them took on the Nigerian Labour Congress. Uh, Nigerians uh, United for Progressive Change, uh, Citizens United for Peace and Stability. These are all NGOs that uh, were hurriedly put together to agitate on behalf of uh, the Buhari government when there was an impasse at the National Assembly over the budget. Uh, you also recall the NSAS uh, of uh, 2020. Uh, there were counter protesters that were engaged, uh, pro Buhari uh, uh, protesters. And then some of them, contrary to the ethos of NGOs, employed violence. Mm -hmm. Remember that somebody was killed here in Guinea mm -hmm. who was participating in the NSAS protest. Mm -hmm. But the government uh, mm -hmm. uh, encouraged or funded counter protesters, utilized violence, and killed uh, protesters, not only. But in a different part. So we have NGOs for hire. You know, uh, NGOs that are now champion private courses. But generally, they are devoid of that core value of altruism. They are doing it for profit. Uh, there's no probity. Sometimes. You see, then after they go and demonstrate in support of government, 
they start fighting themselves over how much they are supposed to have paid and what they are actually paid. There are NGOs that are imperialist agents. One person NGO for private gain, portfolio NGOs who publish glossy reports by and large containing lies. NGOs that have no relevance for the mass of our people. So we also, we also know that. Uh, finally, we are supposed to talk about an ideological appraisal, which is the main trust of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the public. We have tried to emphasize the importance of theory of philosophy. When you say we should look at uh, NGO history and ideological prison, uh, it's a very wide topic. But I can tell you that. Uh, You cannot appreciate and deal with this topic without the use of the tool, the scientific tool of historical and dialectical materialism. Uh, we must recognize that we have had five socioeconomic formations. So economic formation is the economic base operating at a given period in the history of humanity. Very important that we understand this. As far back as we can think, the society that was arranged on the basis of cooperation when we were gathering we are not domesticated agriculture people were transient harvesting ripe fruits and food items the relationship between people in society at that time was founded on cooperation not exploitation. That economic foundation based on cooperation engendered a relationship between members of that society that was also non-antagonistic. We call this era the era of primitive communalism. It was seen as a development of society when some members of the society enslaved others and forced them to work for them. We are talking about the socio-economic uh, formation founded on slave labor, exploitation of slave labor. So the relationship between the slave owners and the enslaved of necessity was antagonistic. That was the first time in the history of humanity where society was separated into classes of exploiters and the exploited. to preserve their privileges and their loot. The exploiters brought into existence the first government. 
of soldiers and policemen employed to suppress revolts of the exploited and also brought it to